Welcome in. I'm Sam Farmer, NFL writer for the Los Angeles Times, and my guest today is NFL film senior producer Greg Cosell. And just a little bit about Greg, um, I regard him as the preeminent evaluator um, in the media of NFL talent, and particularly quarterbacks. We can talk about the the quarterback class of 2020, but I. I do want to ask first, can you please go over your evaluation process of how you look at a quarterback and when does that start? Well, Sam, thank you for the kind words, by the way. I very much appreciate that. Um, For me, it starts with an understanding of the NFL game and what is necessary to succeed at that level. Because ultimately what we're doing is we're transitioning and projecting players to the NFL. Now, you do have to start with traits and attributes and characteristics because obviously every position presents a a series of traits and attributes and characteristics that are necessary to perform. But the NFL game is constantly evolving. And particularly at quarterback, traits that were looked at, let's say, as absolutely essential 15 or 20 years ago. Uh, And you look at a Carson Palmer coming out in 2003. We both know Carson. You know, that particular trait uh, package is – Everybody loves a guy who can sit in the pocket and throw it, but the game has changed. And the game has changed in a number of ways. Now that the shorter passing game is really in vogue in the league, every year there's more and more throws that are 10 yards or less in the air from the line of scrimmage. Every year there seems to be more plays made by quarterbacks that are outside the structure of the offense where they improvise. So there's certain things you look at as you evaluate quarterbacks coming out into the league based on where the league is going. So I think it's critical to start with the NFL first. And I'm very fortunate in my job at NFL Films and doing the NFL Matchup Show that I spend seven, eight months a year really digging into NFL coaching tape. So then when I start my college study, I feel I have a pretty good understanding of what the NFL game is and then how to project players into that. What will the college study look like? Do you look at multiple games of these quarterbacks? Do you uh, go snap by snap through the entire game? Or what's that process? Well, what I do, because, look, I'm, I don't work for a team, so I, clearly my livelihood is not dependent on this. You know, I love doing it. I love the process. But I'll watch seven or eight games with each quarterback. I'll watch all their dropbacks in those seven or eight games. And then what I'll often do, with particularly with the top five or six quarterbacks, is I'll watch all of their 15-plus yard completions, I'll watch all of their interceptions, and I'll watch all of their third downs. So I think that gives me a pretty good sense of what they are. Because I'm seeing, when you watch an entire game, all their dropbacks, you're obviously seeing the incompletions as well. And often incompletions can tell you something about a quarterback just as much or more than just big plays. You provide us with these incredible, uh, incredibly detailed breakdowns of uh, maybe a dozen, 10, 10 to 12 of the quarterbacks that you've evaluated. And uh, so let's dive in to the top tier guys and start with the uh, Joe Burrow. uh, Right. If you start with Burrow, I think he's the best quarterback prospect in this particular draft. Uh, Now, to me, he has everything that you look for. The one thing that he does not have, and different people will deal with this differently, the one thing he does lack is higher level arm strength. Now, he does not have a bad arm. It's not as if he can't make throws, but he does not have a gun. But everything else, when you look at Burrow, you see poise, you see vision, you see clarity, you see timing. You see pocket efficiency. You see precise ball placement. He's a very accurate thrower of the football. And I always use the term ball placement, Sam, because it comes from Bill Walsh, who I was very fortunate to be taught the quarterback position by. So when I think of ball placement, I think of placing it in the exact spot where it needs to be placed, particularly if a receiver is on the move. Because to run after catch is more a function of the quarterback than the receiver. So quarterbacks have to place the ball to a receiver on the move so we can then run after the catch. That's why I tend to use the term ball placement instead of accuracy. That's why sometimes completion percentage can be a little misleading because you can complete a pass, but if it's not really thrown accurately, then the the receiver can get tackled right there when maybe there's 20 more yards to get. Right. Obviously, Burrow has excellent second reaction ability. By that, I mean he can get out of the pocket. He can move to throw, 
in a small area and he can move to throw or run in a larger area. So okay. I think Burrow has everything you really look for. And Alabama's Tua Tagovailoa, uh, very interesting prospect. A lot of people are looking at him as yeah, and, potentially and, the number two pick. Yeah, and he could well be. And I, and I think, to, let's start by saying this. I think almost all quarterbacks, with very few exceptions, are system quarterbacks. And that has a negative connotation, but it shouldn't. Uh, very few quarterbacks are scheme transcendent. There's very few Patrick Mahomes with that kind of talent level. So I think to say that a quarterback is, is, is scheme dependent, so to speak, uh, or a system quarterback is not a negative. And the reason I say that is because I think Tua is that kind of player. I think he's a timing rhythm player who needs the offense to work for him. To me, Sam, if he were to reach his ceiling stylistically, and, and that's the important word here, stylistically, he would have to play like a Drew Brees, the kind of quarterback that would drop back, hit his back foot, the ball comes out. Very rhythmic, very timing-based. He's got a very good accuracy when he plays like that. He has one thing that, that bothers me a little bit, and it's going to have to be cleaned up, and I think it's coachable and can be cleaned up. He has a tendency to to what we call climb the pocket, meaning step up into the pocket when he doesn't need to. And he's six feet tall. And that's short for an NFL quarterback. So if he starts climbing the pocket in the NFL when he doesn't need to, he's going to create his own pressure. He's going to move into bodies. And that's something that, like I said, you can coach that. That can be cleaned up, but it's going to have to be cleaned up. He's walking into a forest there. Correct. <laughs> yeah. Correct. Uh, so rem remember, just before we move on, remember how they always talk with Drew Brees about how it was very important for their center and their two guards to be really good players, almost more so than the offensive tackles because of Brees' height. They wanted space in front of Drew Brees. I think Tua fits into that mold. Justin Herbert of Oregon. Yeah, Justin Herbert's a very interesting guy because he's big. I remember standing next to him at the Combine. Boy, does he look the part. He's big. He's not heavy at all. He looks like an athlete. He's a good athlete. He's got a strong, powerful arm. Uh, he can drive the football. There's a lot of traits, Sam, with Justin Herbert that you really, really like. A couple of things, though, are concerning. Uh, and that's the fact that he's not really a timing and anticipation thrower. He's what I would call a see it throw it quarterback. There were a lot of designed plays this year where the receiver was open and he, he got the ball to them a beat late. Now there were still completions in college football. Whether they're completions in the NFL, they may not be. The other thing, I wouldn't call him a ball distributor. I don't think there's a great sense of timing to his game. He doesn't drop back, hit that back foot, deliver the ball. Now, he obviously did that at Oregon at times because they ran a lot of screens, which are obviously hit your back foot, just get rid of the football. But I'm talking about the, kind of the rhythmic NFL-style pass game. I think that's something you'll have to learn in the same way that Josh Allen is learning that. And Josh Allen came out of Wyoming, and he was not really that kind of quarterback either. And now you get into other factors. You get into the nature of a team. Josh Allen's on a team with a really good defense. Josh Allen's on a team that wants to run the football, and they do it reasonably effectively. So even though Josh Allen is not a 65 68% passer and may never be, he can still function within a team. I think Justin Herbert is more along the lines of that kind of quarterback. Jordan Love, there's a lot of interest in Jordan Love, Utah State quarterback, and a lot of people feel that he's the third best uh, quarterback or maybe the second best quarterback in this draft. I wonder what you think of him. Yeah, Jordan Love is a very skilled quarterback prospect. Now, I talked about Justin Herbert not really being a ball distributor. I think just Jordan Love has those traits. I think he can drop back, hit that back foot, deliver the ball. He's an over-the-top thrower. He's got a very good arm. He's got good movement ability. He's pretty accurate. I would not call accuracy a problem. Um, there were issues at times with it, but I wouldn't say he's scattershot. There are some quarterbacks that are scattershot, and I wouldn't call him scattershot. Um, but I think he needs some work. He needs to be coached. He's going to be very much a function of where he goes and how he's coached. And I think that's a really critical piece for him because he's got some lower body issues as far as not throwing with a firm base and needed balance. These are things that are all coachable. Um, 
I think he needs a, to develop a better feel for what kind of throw is demanded for specific routes. Uh, but that's also coachable. But when you just look at the traits, I think the traits are there. You could make an argument, and this may sound like a bold hot take. To me, it's not. You could make an argument that he's the second best quarterback prospect after uh, uh, Joe Burrow. Now, I know Tua seems to fill that role right now, but I think you could make that argument. Because don't forget, Jordan Love is 6'4 and over 220 pounds. Are there some sort of Patrick Mahomes like traits to Jordan Love? Does he have any? Not to compare those two players. I, I know. You're just, it's Patrick Mahomes light. He doesn't, you know, Patrick Mahomes is truly special in the way he throws a football. His vision on the move is outstanding. Um, so is, is Love in that mold? Yes, you could say he's in that mold, but he's not Patrick Mahomes. Is there, a, is there one quarterback that you'd point to that we should watch? It might be a later round quarterback, but is intriguing to you. Let me just quickly go over a couple. I think that Jacob Eason is a fascinating guy in this draft because he's old school. I mentioned Carson Palmer just sort of in our lead in. He's not quite Carson Palmer, but he's in that mold. He's more of a pure pocket quarterback. And I'm very anxious to see how the NFL sees Jacob Easton in this draft because maybe 20 years ago, he'd be a number one pick in a draft. Over 6'5", 230 pounds. Your blood, your blood so kind of guy, right? Yeah, very easy thrower of the football. I, I know Jacob Eason, and I, I stood next to him throwing the ball numerous times, and it comes out so easily. So he's intriguing to me as to where the NFL sees him. Um, then you get to sort of later round guys. I think there's two guys that fascinate me. One uh, you probably know of because he's in the Pac-12, and that's Jake Luton from Oregon State. And I liked his tape a lot. Um, I actually talked with a quarterback coach in the league, and we, were, we both really liked him, and we were kind of you know, enjoying ourselves talking about him. I think I look at a guy like Jake Luton, who's a little more mobile than people might think, not mobile like Patrick Mahomes, but not a statue for a big quarterback. He's not Mike Glennon, and I think it's easy to say he's that guy, but I think he moves better than that. And I looked at him and said to myself, you know, if you put him in a Sean McVay or Kyle Shanahan offense, I think he could run the offense and be fine. Again, now you get into that whole scheme issue and the system issue, and that's a factor. Um, then there's a kid from FIU named James Morgan, who's a very interesting player as well. And I think he's a guy who throws the ball well, probably a pocket player, but does have movement ability. These are guys who are going to be day three picks. But I think down the road, you could see these guys starting. You, there's so many factors and variables when you start to talk about quarterbacks beyond the top guys, because now you get into team, system, coaching. There are so many factors as to why quarterbacks develop. Look, Kirk Cousins, and no one's going to argue that Kirk Cousins is a top five quarterback in the league, but he was a fourth round pick and he's a starting quarterback and puts up pretty big numbers. You know, again, we, we're not debating what, what he is but he's a starting – you can line up Kirk Cousins and play in the NFL. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, Greg. That was tremendous, and, and I hope that our readers and viewers of LATimes.com got a feel there for the depth of knowledge and uh, incredible attention to detail that, that uh, Greg Cosell has. And uh, you can see why we gravitate to him, particularly this, this time of year, every year. So thanks for checking in.